Hello, honeys, and welcome to the first episode of our brand new series. I'm very excited about it. It is very straightforwardly named, Art That Pisses People Off. So what we'll be doing here for the next approximately five episodes is going theme by theme, you might say, and diving into art that doesn't make sense to most people at first glance, art that typically is found to be frustrating or challenging. Because we will be going thematically, we will have the opportunity to touch on at least two different artworks per episode, and I hope you all have as much fun with this as I expect I will. With that introduction taken care of, I wanted to take a moment here to express some gratitude. I know a couple episodes ago I had mentioned that I was feeling kind of low in terms of my professional career development. Thankfully, this week there have been several things to turn that attitude around from talking to potentially our new sound editor to a couple of different other professional growth opportunities. I am choosing to keep things vague just because I do not want to jinx myself nor seem unprofessional in any way. But on that positive note, let's dive into part one, getting in your space. We had a number of sources this week, including the Gagosian Gallery, the MoMA, the Guggenheim, so feel free to check that source document link in the episode description if you would like to find out more about our sources, otherwise trust they were reliable. I've decided to title our first chapter, part, whatever you want to call it here, getting in your space because the main idea of all the art we're going to talk about in this episode is forcing people to move around the artwork as an exploration into physical space by making the viewer think about their bodily interaction with this immobile piece of art. The origins of these explorations are found in post-war art, aka the art created in the 15-20 years-ish post-World War II. All of that really set the stage. One post-war figure who was among the earliest to engage in these explorations of physical space and bodily interactions was an American by the name of Donald Judd. Although Judd was not alone in these explorations or in this type of art by any means, he is a good figure, a good artist to start with because his artworks are very obviously connected to the ones we're going to talk about later in this episode. There's a sort of clear evolution between him and you know, the rest of the timeline, and also because I have seen some of his works in person and can speak to them a little bit better. Donald Judd was born in 1928 and passed in 1994. He went from art critic to artist who focused on 3D interactions of art and quote-unquote real space. The MoMA provides a sort of timeline of his works which help explain his impact on the arts and on art history. Beginning in 1964, Judd began contracting sheet metal fabricators to make works out of materials such as metals and other industrial ones, thereby removing his quote-unquote hand, which was a previously hugely important concept as well as a sort of means unofficial of measuring an artist's skill. By contracting his work out in a commercial way, he totally changed perceptions of what the process of making art could be. For the rest of the 1960s, Judd created lots of recognizable and iconic forms with his sculptures. The first stacks are intermittent boxes stacked vertically with some space between 
from ceiling to floor. Then you have progressions, which are forms based on numeric sequences, as well as box-like forms, which are usually installed into floors. And finally, various geometric forms, which appear to lean against walls while protruding out into the viewer space. Being at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago and watching people interact with his work was sort of hilarious because they would walk around once or twice and then just be like, I don't get it. Do you get it? The other person would also walk around once or twice and be like, I don't get it. And they were doing exactly what the point of the sculpture is to do. So they they didn't realize that they were getting it. Of course, I was not impolite about it, but it was a funny thing to notice. Judd also spent his later years building the Chinatti Foundation in Marfa, Texas. This involved bringing on major figures such as the Dia Art Foundation, Larry Bell, whose work often included nested boxes of varying colors and translucency, John Chamberlain, who used found often industrial materials in his sculptures, and Dan Flavin, a guy who's pretty famous for his neon and light-based works. Nowadays, the Chinatti Foundation is a large-scale multi-building museum with lots of installations, especially by the aforementioned artists. One hugely important connection point between Donald Judd's works and the rest of the artists that we're going to talk about is that their work is site-specific, meaning that it is designed to interact with the physical boundaries of the space that it exists within. At the time of Judd's come up in the 1960s, site-specific as a term and as a practice was just coming into the picture. Since it is such an important connection point between our next two artists and Judd, we are going to talk about it just a little bit further. The National Gallery of Scotland does a nice job of summarizing it all up by saying, quote, while the term site-specific is general and broad-ranging, it came into popular use in the 1960s. Many artists, particularly in the United States, reacted against pure minimalism, which they felt had become increasingly commercialized. In producing works of art on site, they exclusively belonged to the place they were made for and could not be reduced to decorative fodder for wealthy patrons and buyers, end quote. Site-specific art became an umbrella under which lots of other modern art movements developed, such as land art, conceptual art, and other ones of the 60s and 70s. Other important names that you may have heard of that are figures in these post-war and or conceptual movements include Carl Andre, Eva Hesse, Sol Lewitt, Robert Smithson, Philip Gustin, Robert Rochenberg, Ad Reinhardt, Joseph Albers, and Frank Stella. And thus, art that gets in your way, art that gets in your space, art about space, was born. As all things do, over the years it has evolved, so let's go forward in time a little bit, or I guess catch back up to the present, whichever way you want to look at it, and talk about some more recent examples of art that gets in your space. I mentioned a couple business episodes back the passing of Richard Serra, who was a very important artist in this regard. So let's talk about him, his life, and a couple of controversies surrounding his artworks. Sarah was born November 2nd, 1938, and recently passed on March 26th, 2024. He was an American who originally pursued literature at UC Berkeley before transferring to UC Santa Barbara, but he also spent time working in steel mills, which many speculate was his inspiration for the industrial materials used throughout his art career. 
Sarah was a champion of site-specific works, especially works that played with the architecture around it at grand scale. He often incorporated other industrial materials besides steel, such as rubber or neon, into his work, though the majority of it was steel. The Dia Art Foundation says, quote, Throughout his career, Sarah's work engaged with ways of relating movement to material and space. These concerns remained central to the steel sculptures he made in the 1990s and early 2000s, end quote. They say that his sculptures, quote, force people to consider material based on scale and presence. They draw attention to objects as well as architecture within daily life. In other words, Sarah created literally monumental ways of interfering with boundaries of personal as well as architectural space in order to inspire consideration of bodily relationships not only with the statue, but also with the walls, the ceiling, the floor even. And according to the Gagosian Gallery website, not only is the scale of the works huge, but so is the scale of Sarah's impact. He has produced site-specific sculptures for, as well as landscape settings, all across the globe, literally. He has had shows and exhibitions at such famous sites as the Pasadena Art Museum, the MoMA, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, the Museo Nacional Centro de Arte Reina Sofia in Madrid, the Guggenheim Bilbao, and more. He additionally moved throughout mediums as he and his career matured. He eventually turned to video and film as well as natural materials. And you may remember with that obituary announcement, I promised you all that we would cover a very famous story involving his artwork. And here we go. The story of his removed installation, which once stood at the Federal Plaza in New York City. In 1981, Sarah won a commission by the Arts in Architecture program of the U.S. General Services Administration and artwork to be made and installed in that space. Sarah supposedly studies for a good chunk of time the use of this plaza, people's natural walking paths and any other way they might spend their time there before finalizing his design. The Tate Modern says, quote, Sarah was honored by the commission awarded by a panel of experts and spent two years planning it, believing the work would be a permanent addition to this busy area of the city, end quote. Finally, the installation date rolls around, and what goes in is an enormous, slightly curved 120-foot or 36-meter long, 12-foot high or 3.6-meter high, 15-ton wall of raw steel cutting across the middle of the plaza. The curve leaned away from its base and was anchored at both ends so that the center of the sculpture was slightly raised above the ground. Sarah intentionally settled on this plaza having design because it forced the people passing through that space to go around this massive thing. And in Sarah's own words, the viewer becomes aware of himself and of his movement through the plaza. As he moves, the sculpture changes. Contraction and expansion of the sculpture results from the viewer's movement. Step by step, the perception of not only the sculpture, but of the entire environment changes. End quote. Khan Academy points out that Sarah shared this interest in altering perception, particularly visual experience, with many of his minimalist colleagues. Immediately, though, everybody who works in the Federal Plaza thinks that this is awful and annoying. And if you think, well, duh, allow me to talk this through a little further before you just solidify your opinion. He must have known that there would be an element of annoyance when interacting with this giant sculpture. So it's possible that he underestimated that risk and the consequences 
because of it. Regardless of his intention, users of Federal Plaza went after it so hard that they did eventually get it removed in a big art world scandal. Possibly the coolest part of this story is how many art world people came to Sarah's defense, how much solidarity was demonstrated there, and how long they were able to make that fight last as a result. In 1985, Judge Edward Ray begins a letter writing campaign to have the $175,000 artwork removed. Four years later, William Diamond, who was the regional administrator for the GSA, anyway, Diamond decides to hold a public hearing about the removal of Tilted Ark. At this March 1985 hearing, according to PBS, quote, 122 people testify in favor of retaining the sculpture and 58 testify in favor of removing it. The art establishment, artists, museum curators, and art critics testify that Tilted Ark is a great work of art. Those against the sculpture, for the most part, people who work at Federal Plaza, say that the sculpture interferes with public use of the plaza, end quote. Wikipedia notes that Sarah's defense to preserve the sculpture, in his own words, as well as several other supporters of his, to remove Tilted Ark because it is site-specific, is to destroy it, in so doing taking admittedly a bit of an arts-for-arts-sake kind of stance, and essentially saying he would disown it if it were relocated or changed in any way. Aside from that drama, and perhaps more importantly, the case gained a lot of attention because of its implications for future art installations. As Khan Academy says, quote, Proponents of the sculpture stated that removing the sculpture at the request of a few would infringe upon Sarah's First Amendment right to free speech, and therefore was un-American. Some emphasized that difficult artworks often become masterpieces only after an initial controversy, for example, Manny's Olympia, end quote. Unfortunately, though, Sarah loses this round. Sarah then begins a long series of appeals that continues until his final defeat in March of 1989. The night of March 15th that year, federal workers secretively chopped up titled Ark into three pieces, removed it from Federal Plaza, and lugged it to a scrap metal yard. PBS makes a nice summary of the importance of this case in art history as well as legal history by describing how these rulings raise multiple questions central to the arts in the 1980s. The role of government funding of the arts, artistic boundaries, the rights of artists, the role of the public in determining the value of an artwork, and finally, popularity versus quality of public art and the debates surrounding that. In perhaps what is the only good luck here, Sarah remains unbothered and his career does not suffer for this incident. What's fascinating, however, is that this is not the first time that Sarah's faced controversy and potential removal of one of his artworks because it frustrated the public too much. The story of the removal of 1983 Clara Clara is very similar. The piece was originally located in the Tuileries Garden in Paris, installed in 1983 as part of a larger retrospective at the Centre Pompidou, which I mentioned briefly in my listing earlier, but it was deemed too heavy for the floors inside the building it would have caused too much damage, so it was relocated outdoors. The hyperallergic article detailing this incident described the work as, quote, two 10-foot-high panels which were placed with the vertex of their parabolic curves nearly conjoined, save for a 6-foot opening between them. 
peering through this gap were the Egyptian Luxor obelisk in the Place de la Concorde in one direction and the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel and the Louvre in the distance. End quote. Because this was six years before the iconic glass pyramid in front of the building was installed, one would have had a direct view to the Louvre. And because it was part of this line of arcs, it complemented the historic Napoleonic axis and really nicely juxtaposed with the classical gardens, or at least was intended to do so. Once again, this work faced wide and immediate public pushback because of its quote-unquote ugliness and that intentional clash with the site. Six months later, it was removed and shuffled around before ending up in the back lot of a water plant in ivry sur seine an industrial town southeast of Paris. One of the locations it was shuffled to the Parc de Choisy in 1985, it was squished into a tiny grass plot and graffitied pretty frequently, used as a sports backboard and shelter and otherwise unintentionally mishandled. At the time, Richard Serra called out the mayor of Paris for this maltreatment and he, the mayor that is, reinstalled the sculpture for Monumenta 2008. At that point, its return to Tuileries was publicly and in the press debated, but in 2009, it was disassembled again and quote-unquote stored once more, although from what we're able to tell, very poorly. And the components of the work have been lost to obscurity ever since. The next artist we will talk about is also a sculptor, Anish Kapoor, whose best known work is arguably a little something called Cloudgate. Born in 1954, Kapoor is an Indian born British artist who, according to Wikipedia, has, quote, a reputation for creating spectacles in urban settings by producing works of extreme size and scale. Before creating Cloudgate, Kapoor had created art that distorted images of the viewer instead of portraying images of its own. In doing so, he acquired experience blurring the boundary between the limit and the limitless, end quote. Now, us Chicagoans know that its real name is Cloudgate, but you all might know it better as the one, the only, the bean. Located in Millennium Park within the AT&T Plaza, aka, you know, that big park, like right in the middle of the loop, it is the result of a design competition. And a rather prestigious and tough one at that. I mean, other competitors included Jeff Koons, the balloon dog guy. After the selection of Kapoor and his design, some concerns about the technical details of not only the bean itself, but the load-bearing capacities of the roof of the restaurant below it were raised. Eventually, though, Kapoor and the commissioning board found experts and the right people to make this happen, although it took longer and was certainly more expensive. It appears the final price tag was close to $11.5 million. According to the Millennium Park Foundation, however, quote, the cost of Cloudgate was completely underwritten by the Millennium Park Foundation using funds from private donors, end quote. We love it when people create public art with their money. Nice job, donors. The bean was constructed between 04 and 06 and quickly gained that nickname because of its iconic organic shape. The sculpture is made up of computer modeled and cut stainless steel plates, a total of 168 of them, welded together within interior support structure made with flexible connectors so as to allow for the kinds of temperature changes that we experience in Chicago and the steel's responses to those changes. It is, of course, recognizable by that seamless reflective surface and is 33 by 66 by 42 feet or 10 meters by 20 meters by 13 meters 
It weighs 100 tons and is, for those reasons, among the world's largest permanent outdoor installations. The piece is inspired by liquid mercury and designed to reflect and distort the city skyline, but also to be kind of interactive. And this is why it's been chosen for getting in your space. The 12 foot or 3.7 meter arch in the center allows one to pass underneath or sort of through the bean. With its mix of convex and concave surfaces, no two reflection is ever the same, especially because all of the surfaces are reflective. So standing underneath the arch, especially dead center, looking up at the smallest, most convex portion of the bean, it's possible to see yourself in multiple surfaces with multiple distortions at once. This seeing of many selves can be very disorienting, but it also draws your attention to the people who are immediately next to you, you know, down on the ground, but whose reflections are interacting in funhouse mirror unexpected ways with your own and thus connecting you to them in some way. That's really the magic of the bean, is that despite its weight and size, this reflectiveness and curvature makes it look weightless in some ways and refocuses the attention on you and on your experience and how your body looks in those reflections, how it feels to touch your hand to the cool surface or to hold hands with somebody or not and have it look like you're doing the opposite in the mirrors on your right, left, above, wherever. Of course, as a bit of a reality check moment here and a reference to a once popular Facebook campaign, because of this extreme reflectiveness, the lower six feet are wiped down twice daily with the whole thing getting a twice yearly cleaning. Any graffiti which might be etched or painted onto it is quickly removed by the original polishing firm. Many Arts World figures agree that the bean as a sculpture showcases and builds upon lots of Kapoor's main artistic themes. They also note its impressive ability to draw in an audience, though they do note that that is mostly because of the photo taking reflective opportunities. A final note, which may be of some satisfaction to my fellow Chicagoans, although Kapoor originally hated the nickname The Bean, he has since admitted that it has grown on him. Maybe because this was his first public outdoor work installed in the U.S. More importantly, however, he notes how part of the popularity of the bean is its ability to be many things for many people through the way they interact with it. In the Chicago Sun-Times, he says, quote, In one way, Cloudgate is mine, but in another way, it has taken on all kinds of other lives. It has incorporated the life of all those millions of people who have taken wedding pictures there or else posed in front or beneath it, and they now own it more than I do. It is the ultimate selfie object, and I think it has become the focus of a different view of Chicago, too, part of the city and its public space, end quote. Clearly, Kapoor recognizes the value of an artwork that is something in and of itself, but that also gains much more significance and celebration by becoming a geographic and cultural element as well. I understand I'm starting to beat a dead horse here with my hometown passion, so a bit more technical reasons why this work matters, why it's relevant here. Once again, it is site-specific, meaning it not only affects the space around it in some way, like Richard Serra's Tilted Arc cut Federal Plaza in half, but also that it was designed to do so. 
In this case, because of the verticality of the city of Chicago, Kapoor aimed for horizontality. He wanted to explore an ovioid shape in the very geometric surroundings, especially the buildings just outside of Millennium Park. The work is all about perspective and bodily relationships. As I said, no two views are ever the same, and that can affect your interaction with people, not only physically, but also visually. The movement, furthermore, of a person's body around and through this, this monument, really, encourages changing perceptions of your own relationships between your body inside and outside space, even though it's technically all outdoors, and the sculpture. Finally, it encourages its own Chicago-ness by reflecting the iconic surroundings, the skyline surrounding it. Of course, this encourages visitors to pay attention to the nearby space as much as they are to the sculpture. I really, really, really wanted to, at this time, talk about, because this is art history, and I want to be honest with you all, how Kapoor can be a real ass, aka the Vanta Black story. However, we have more relevant things to discuss, so we'll perhaps hold that one off for an episode I'm thinking about doing in this series regarding color. Stay tuned, maybe you will hear it. Suffice to say, for now, that the reason that I considered including that story is because it does tie back to Cloudgate slash The Bean in some sense. So we will just include that some sense. As Art News puts it, quote, The artist's dual interests in reflectivity and light absorbency and their opposite effects in a work of art seem to be working in opposition as well as being two sides of the same coin. We asked Kapoor if it was one or the other, and he simply responded, yes. The mirror works are concave and hollow spaces full of mirrors. The black works are filled with darkness, he said. They are opposite and equal, and all quotes. A story we can, should, and will get into in this episode is the art news write-up, the words of Alex Greenberger in regards to Kapoor's mini bean, as it is so nicely referred to in the article. In February of 2023, Kapoor installed the quote-unquote mini bean, which really is the nicest possible name for it, I was not trying to be sarcastic there, in Manhattan, New York City, but it does not live up to the original in many critical opinions. It is located on the previously nondescript corner of Leonard Street in Tribeca, and Art News describes it as, quote, a 19-foot-tall sculpture that resembles a legume being squashed by a luxury building, its steel form appearing to bulge out beneath the weight of a sleek outcropping, end quote. For some reason, apparently, this was always the plan for it to look ominous and weird and not weightless. And the cost of this thing was up to $10 million. Greenberger describes it basically just as unpopular and not aesthetically pleasing. He says directly, Kapoor's latest is a big, shiny, reflective object that feels like the final boss of ugly public art in New York. Not that that will stop people from flocking to it. Later in the article, he writes, In some ways, it feels like a mistake to call Kapoor's sculpture public art, however, since the structure above it is about as private as it gets. Widespread critical opinion indicates basically that this work is not up to par with his other sculptures and disturbing in how it reflects its surroundings. It's considered even more of a disappointment because of how hard some New Yorkers fought against it, largely in support of the OG Chicago Bean. This appears to be a missed opportunity to act on the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. All right.
right, honeys, this has been our first chapter of Art That Pisses People Off, Getting In Your Space. We have nicely, I think, been able to get our feet wet in terms of learning about sculpture that takes up space, gets into our space, forces us to bodily interact with it. I hope you've been able to follow as we traced the origins through examples that are even popping up today. Though I could probably make a series of this type of art in and of itself, I hope that this light coverage has been enough to give you a basic working understanding. And I will catch you all next week with chapter two. I would like to be able to tell you which episode it's going to be, but I haven't quite decided on the topic yet. So stay tuned and you will be getting a lovely surprise in terms of that announcement sometime early next week. In the meantime, have a wonderful weekend, honeys. Take care of yourselves and get some sunshine if you can. This podcast was created, produced, written, hosted, edited, and fact-checked by master's graduate Celia Bugno. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe on all of your favorite streaming platforms as well as your social medias.